Hey docs, this is Dr. Ranjit, introducing Dr. Naman Agrawal, MD Emergency Medicine Ames. Hi sir, let's discuss about a new case today. Okay. Again, it's a similar kind of case. Yeah. An old man has presented to the emergency medicine with the similar complaints of shortness of breath and uh, chest pain. Okay, what would be the other diagnosis? Five or six are the important, big six or big five as you can say. Acute corneal syndrome, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, acute pericarditis which may lead to tamponade and esophageal rupture. How does a patient with pulmonary embolism present to ED? Pulmonary embolism is also referred as great masquerader. It has varied presentations. It does not present in a usual way and it is missed. Presentation of pulmonary embolism is shortness of breath and chest pain and most common sign is tachypnea. Uh, apart from the typical presentation of shortness of breath and chest pain, patients can also present with syncope, seizures and ordered sensorium. These are some atypical presentations. They can be seen in up to 5 to 10 percent of the patients with a diagnosed pulmonary embolism. What is pulmonary embolism? Okay, actually as the name suggests, it is an embolus to the lungs. So what does an embolus mean? Uh, anything which traverses from one source in the blood vessels to a distant source. But what we mean commonly by pulmonary embolism is pulmonary thromboembolism, which has a source somewhere, most commonly in the proximal lower limb veins. Uh, there is a thrombus which forms there because of many other risk factors and causes. It dislodges from that place, from the uh, and going through the right side of the heart, from the inferior vena cava to the right side of the heart. It lodges in the pulmonary capillaries or in the major arteries or veins. When do you suspect that okay, this might be a case of pulmonary embolism? Actually, there are no guidelines for suspecting pulmonary embolism. One of the conditions which is re referred is suddenness of onset. Okay. If the patient is having most important, if the patient is having risk factors, pro-coagulable states, if the patient is taking medications which predispose to thrombosis, if the patient is se severely dehydrated. If the patient is having immobilization in the form of hemiparesis, okay. orthopedic immobilization mm -hmm. or neurologic immobilization, mm -hmm. such patients are highly predisposed to develop a thrombus which can then embolize. Okay. And as I mentioned, some thrombophilias which could be inherited or acquired. Most common acquired thrombophilias include malignancy okay. and trauma. Okay. What are the important findings of pulmonary embolism? Uh, chest pain, we need to be diligent in the form of Socrates. We need to take the history properly. Usually chest pain can be of two types in pulmonary embolism. If it is a large pulmonary embolism in the center, it causes right ventricular ischemia. So an ischemic chest pain would result. If it is a peripheral pulmonary embolism which leads to infarction, a pleuritic cloud of the chest pain uh, which is lateralized to one side, either right or the left side, usually occurs in that way. The chest pain can vary depending on the site of pulmonary embolism. Uh, apart from that, shortness of breath is one of the findings. Important uh, on clinical examination, it is important that absence of chest findings, like if the patient is significantly tachypneic and having shortness of breath and you find perfectly normal findings on examination. Mm -hmm. This is one pointer that this could be pulmonary embolism. Another condition where you see this kind of findings is mesenteric ischemia, in which the patient is having significant abdominal pain, but there is no tenderness. And you wonder why is the patient shouting in pain? It's similar to mesenteric ischemia. So we, we call it a mesenteric ischemia of chest. So the patient would be significantly symptomatic without any chest findings. On uh, vital examination, most common finding is tachypnea. Mm -hmm. Another prominent finding is tachycardia which usually is cited as the most common finding. Apart from that, depending on load of the embolus, various findings on the chest can be seen. If the embolus has led to a pulmonary infarct, you can find localized crepitations on one side. You can see a loud P2, which could be appreciated because of pulmonary artery hypertension and a murmur of TR probably, if it could, could be appreciated in the emergency department, it would uh, be the finding which is suggestive of pulmonary embolism. So these are the clinical findings which should point towards uh, pulmonary embolism. As the patient has presented with uh, chest pain, when we do an ECG, what would be the changes seen in pulmonary embolism? Uh, as pulmonary embolism can cause a lot of ECG changes. As you rightly said, if the patient presents the chest pain, it's, it is usual to get a chest ECG done because you know you have an acute coronary syndrome as a differential diagnosis. In pulmonary embolism, a pseudo-infarction pattern can be seen. It can manifest as an inferior wall MI, but actually it's really not an inferior wall MI. So most common ECG findings uh, on uh, in pulmonary embolism actually is simultaneous T wave inversion in inferior and septal leads. Okay. Inferior means 2, 3 AVF and septal means V1, V2 plus minus V3. So if there are simultaneous T wave inversions okay. and if it is acute in onset, mm -hmm. that is almost always pulmonary embolism. If you have acute coronary syndrome as a differential diagnosis, keep it down. First of all, you should investigate the patient for pulmonary embolism. Sinus tachycardia is again a common finding, but as I told you, it is not always present. Apart from this, uh, non-specific STT changes can always be seen. Uh, right bundle branch block, features of right ventricular hypertrophy, right axis deviation, etc. These are the changes which can be seen at the time of uh, pulmonary embolism. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe.